for a living. I can tell them I sell fertilizer. At first, I get that kind of we do what? Um, everything has more to do with logistics. I work with rail, I work with barges, I work with trucks. Um, we got to get fertilizer to the right place at the right time. And that's really the, the, the whole key here. The market has gone to a just in time mentality. Meaning that we don't really want to buy it too far ahead because we're not sure what the market's going to do. We're not sure how many acres of corn is going to get planted. We're not sure what the market's going to be up or down. It's just in time. So, what does just in time mean? Here we are about mid February. We're in Minnesota. We're going to plant corn in a couple months. We have warehouses. We use a river a lot. So, warehouses are in St. Paul along the river. Just in time inventory means in the upper Mississippi today, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. We have no inventory of urea. We have no inventory of phosphates after that. We have potash. The reason we have potash is it's from well, Canada. So the rail comes southwards. But the river's not working. It's not moving north, right? A lot of our stuff comes up that river. Now, that's a little disturbing, and I'll say right now I'm a little nervous. This is a nervous time of year for me. All the news that comes out is always negative. This isn't working. This isn't working. That's not going to happen. On the other hand, that's typical. Truth be told, this time of year, very rarely do we have inventory in the same fall. The good news is the guys at Federated have inventory in their ships. They're going to be full to start. But as I was told, the plant that I sent you, they're going to turn that four times. That means it's full today. They're going to empty it, fill it up, empty it, fill it up, empty it, fill it up. All the time you're going to plant corn. That's just in time inventory. <coughs> So I'll share a couple of things that's happening right now in just-in-time inventory. The things that make me nervous. The river. The river's always nervous, right? My book of business is such that I need 17 good days to move fertilizer to get my book done. Typically, that's it's a lot, but it's very manageable. The river opens on April the 10th, and by you know May the 10th, that's 30 days, we're done. 17 days, and that's a piece of cake. Some challenges I have today. There's a lot north of St. Louis that's not functioning very well. It's not functioning at all. It's a big lock. It's a lock where you put 30 barges in, float them up, move 30 barges out. Pretty slick process. That's down until maybe June. That may be a little bit of exaggeration, but anyway, we're not going to use it for spring. Here's a lock next to it. The old one is still there. That's good news. But the old one only holds about six barges. So you push six in, float them up, push them out, time them up, go back, get six more, push them in. It takes a little more time. So I'm a little bit nervous about, okay, we've got to get all these barges up. I've got them all sold. I've got to make sure they get it. And I'm pretty confident we'll get through that lock system. What I'm not so sure about yet is Lake Pepin. Lake Pepin sits just south of the Twin Cities. Lake Pepin is uh, a lake that the Mississippi flows through. We have to push barges through. I don't know how much ice is on Lake Pepin today. But everybody that I talk to that's an ice fisherman, they keep telling me they're adding on to their augers to get down into water to get through the ice. And as cold as it's been, I'm pretty confident there's a lot of ice on Lake Pepin. I need the sun to shine, I need the thing to warm up so we get through that thing in the first part of the year. So there, I'm a little nervous there. So the other side, everybody says, I start to think, well, let's rail it in. Let's do rail. Rail isn't much better. <coughs> rail lines are backed up. Right now, if I put a border in, I can't get a train rail to me until sometime in April. That's too late. Part of the reason the rail lines are backed up, an awful lot of our rail is done by the BN, going to Northern. The BN is awfully happy today to pull oil on North Dakota. There's all kinds of oil, there's all kinds of oil cars every day. They don't have to think and plan ahead. Every day they go up there, there's oil cars ready for them to pull. In the fertilizer business, I only need them between now and spring. You know, that's good business for a short term, but long term, and they'd rather pull oil it's every day. And the grain guys are struggling too. They're trying to get grain out west, and the rail cars aren't moving. So the rail is a little bit of a challenge. It's all kind of gloom and doom to start with this thing. Now. So let's change it. Let's put some more destiny in, in it, what we can control up here in Minnesota. One of our objectives is to become more secure in our sourcing of products. Okay? As we source products today, again, I'm a buyer and seller. These are all the people that we work with. And we've got some really good partners in this. We've got some people that, that work with us, and, and it's important for them to do that. We get supply, get pricing, get things in place. So we do have some good partners. We look at the world. 
we source from 20 different countries. We'll break it down by product. A fair amount of the end comes from the U.S. Yet yeah? we'll get a little bit out of Canada most years. Today, Canada is short, so we're actually moving urea back into those folks. 60% of the urea we apply is imported. Okay? A lot of it's imported from South America. A lot of it too, North Africa and the Arab Gulf. The reason why these two cropped up has to do with natural gas. <coughs> 15, 20 years ago, natural gas in the U.S. was cost effective. Pretty much all of our nitrogen was produced here. We went from about a buck and a half, two dollars an mm BTU, up to 13. A lot of our plants closed. These folks opened up because they were still operating in those ranges. And now we're getting back down to two dollars again. This thing is something that moves. We'll look at phosphates. Most of our phosphates still come out of Florida. We have for a long time. Really, that's been our main source. The challenge here is that our source in Florida is starting to run out a little bit. Our rock isn't as good as it used to be. They have to dig more rock to get a ton of fertilizer. Interesting enough, the best rock in the world is in Morocco, North Africa. As we move forward, we will see more and more imported phosphates. That will be a challenge as, as we look forward. Potash. There's a small amount of potash that comes out of the U.S., down in the Southwest. But for the most part, potash comes out of Canada. We'll still call that an import. It comes from a different country. There's a little bit that comes out of Russia. We'll talk about that later. And we actually get some out of Israel. They're kind of a new player in this market. They've actually got a pretty good product. So we source from 20 different countries. Fertilizer is coming from all over the world. Where is it coming from? We talked about South America, Trinidad. That's all nitrogens. Nitrogen, or, excuse me, natural gas is cheap down there. Made for cost effective nitrogen. Again, when you make a plant, you make it all year round. They're making nitrogen today, urea. We'll put it on a ship, <coughs> bring it to the, the Gulf at Galveston, take it off of Galveston, put it on a rail car, and we'll move it up here to western Minnesota or the Dakotas. <coughs> the challenge with that is when it comes out of Trinidad, it's hot to the touch, it's warm to the touch. <coughs> By the time we get that on a rail car, bring it up here in sub zero temperatures, the whole car urea goes, it's tight. Guys open them cars and nothing comes out of the bottom. So they really don't like bringing it in in January and February. They want to wait until March and April. And again, we're just back to that just in time. It's a little bit snug. Here's Canada, a little bit of nitrogen in that. Most of that's potash. Here's the Arab Gulf. Again, the Arab Gulf would pretty much all be nitrogens today. So we're going to do that. We're going to buy some fertilizer in the Arab Gulf. What does that really mean to you? What do you care where it comes from? Oops. We're going to make that deal. We're going to call them up and say, hey, we need some urea. It's going to take four or five days to get our price point or whatever it takes. They're going to say, yeah, we can do that. It's going to take 10 or 20 days to find us a ship, get that ship into the port, get it under the spout. It takes about five or six days to load that ship. It takes about 35 days to go through, uh, to get to the U.S., go through the Suez Canal. That's if Egypt doesn't have a little political unrest and everything's going well there. If Egypt's a problem, we go a long way. It takes another 10 days. We're going to unload that ship. We're going to do it fairly quick, five days or so. We're going to transport it up the river. Again, that's make sure the river's running right. We've got a barge that's empty waiting for us. We've got a tow that's waiting for us. We're going to hope that that's right. Then we're going to unload it and get it out to the destination in two days. So the point of the whole conversation is 77 days from start to finish. So if I think I'm a little bit short today, and I need to read for you guys for Pre plant, plant corn, not too late. We gotta plan ahead. We gotta know far enough ahead of time what our demand is gonna be if we have enough fertilizer. Alright, so we want to change a little bit. We want something a little more controllable, right? Something that we can control. We are in the planning stage in the process of building a world-class nitrogen facility in Spirit with North Dakota. That's right along Interstate 94, just west of Fargo. It's going to be a nice plant. It's going to burn a lot of natural gas. There's a lot of natural gas in North Dakota. 80,000 mm BTUs a day. Now, I know that's a lot of gas, but I'm not going to do that. Square my head. What does that really mean? It's going to use a lot of electricity. What does that mean? Well, here's a number I can wrap my head around. 
2,200 gallons of water every minute, every hour, every day. This thing's going to take a lot of stuff. It makes it nice. Okay. But the pro is, it's, it's close. I don't have to depend on the ocean and the river. It's the truck driving. Is. That's a good deal for us. So what's it going to make? It's going to make 750,000 ton of anhydrous ammonia. And that's our first base product. We take natural gas, we make anhydrous ammonia. From that, we upgrade to urea. From that, we upgrade to liquids. That's 28 or 32. We'll call that UAN. Bottom line, if we put a pile together, because we'll make all three, we're going to make 1.5 million tons of nitrogen. That's a big deal. That's a good deal for our market. About 12% of the, the imported urea coming in today will make in North Dakota. So we'll take 12% out of that, the import number. All right, so what does this look like today? What's, what's the stage look like? It's a little busy, but you'll get the point, I guess. Um, existing plants in the U.S. are kind of scattered all over there in blue. Yellow plants are expansions. There's a bunch of expansion down here in Louisiana. A lot of nitrogen's come out of Louisiana. There's plant expansions out here in the, the, the southwest. Plant expansions in Sioux City. There's a lot of expansions. Proposed plants in Texas, next to us in North Dakota, Iowa, Illinois, a lot of new ones. Now, interesting enough, looks like a lot of expansions and a lot of new plants. There has not been a new nitrogen facility built in the United States since the late 70s, at least 77. Why are all these people coming back in and jumping in? Gas is affordable. The nitrogen market's been profitable. So, there's money to be made, a lot of people want in. A lot more people, I think, are getting in than maybe we all guess. Here's all the new projects. Here's all the tons of nitrogen that will be added to the market just in the U.S. That's a game changer. A game changer over there. There's us. There's one already that backed out. They said, oh, too many players getting in. Here's some more at risk. An interesting point, the bottom one at risk, is a plant that we were engaged with in Texas. It's a clean energy plant going to burn coal, going to have urea as kind of a byproduct. 750,000 tons. We thought that was a good, good deal. We were going to market that urea for them. That project now is off the table because they can't find enough investors. There's too many players jumping in. We'll put that on the graph. Here's our demand. Most important curve on there. Peaked last year, 2013. Why did it peak? Because we think corn acres peaked. Corn market peaked. Now corn market's coming down. We're going to plant a little less corn. The corn demand's going to back and tail off a little bit. Look at production. Trail on almost like we're going to move up. And by the way, 2016, 2017, that's when we think our plant's going to come out of North Dakota. It's going to take us two or three years yet. <clears throat> going to have more demand, than, excuse me, more supply than demand. Obviously, we'll see the imports tail off. What else, what else will we see here? We'll see the price come down a little bit. Thing. That should be a good deal for you guys. And again, it's close to home. Now again, I'm talking a little bit about rail, I'm talking about Galveston. Galveston's important to us because we import a lot of urea. We may turn around and export urea out of Galveston in the future. Our plant's going to sit on the BN. We'll be able to load rail cars. If there's not enough demand in this market, we'll move itself and move to the world market. We're going to continue to invest to in local storage. We need to do that. We know we need to, uh, to have our inventory close at hand in places that we can grab them. Here's what we look like on a world scale. Inventories, uh, warehouses. Here's what we look like on the U.S. There's some upgrades we've done a recently. Watertown, Muscatine, Iowa, out in Nebraska, down there in Galveston. My hope is the next one is St. Paul. Any of you have been through St. Paul? Uh, we have a warehouse over there. We can move fertilizer, but we need some updates. That, that's high on my list, that we have to get that one next. Can't talk much about agriculture, fertilizer. We don't talk about China, right? You know, I talk about China, the demand, and where they're at, and what they're going to do. Interesting enough, in fertilizer, they export a fair amount of nitrogen, a fair amount of urea. 
They're kind of new to the game, but then a lot of folks are. Their tax, their government controls what they export by their tax. Their tax comes up and down all year long. Meaning that if they're short in their country, their tax goes way up, then they're not, they don't fit the world market so that they pull back. <coughs> if they got plenty, if they got extras, their tax goes down and they move it out in the marketplace. So it's a little bit of a, of a game to try to figure out what their tax is going to be. But the time you've got to figure out the change here. But on the other hand, they're very unique into doing business. Meaning that in January, they were going to send five vessels a year into the U.S. That, that was the word on the street. And that made the market come down a little bit. Two or three weeks ago, they said, no, we're just going to send three to the U.S. That made the market go back up a little bit. Now, a challenge in all that is, were they ever going to send five? Are they, are they only going to send three? Or are they going to go back and send five now that the market's up and do a little more? They're not the easiest people to read, and they're going to do what favors them. So again, a little bit of poker being played there, but trying to outguess them just, just doesn't work. So a little closer to home. You know, all this now we've talked about the world and, and how that would maybe impact you, but really what does that mean? We're going to plant corn in a couple months. We need to know how big this corn crop is going to be. Again, we know it's going to be off a little bit. Really in Minnesota, though, our acres don't change much. Corn acres are pretty consistent. We may move a percent or two, but we're not going to be like the Dakotas that are going to swing 10 20 percent. So that makes my job a little bit show. Fairly predictable, I think, anyway, what my demands are. But we're going to be in, whoops, wrong button. We're going to be in early spring or late spring. And there's pros and cons of both. Obviously, a little bit of a late spring, we need more time to get the inventory up here to get it in place. I like that. It's a river. But on the other hand, a late spring means that things can get condensed. The last spring was too late. We pretty much did all the fertilization in Minnesota in about five days, and that's too fast. We don't have the infrastructure to handle that. I need that really nice free week. We'll talk about the charts a little bit. And you'll see how this thing kind of sets up and why we have zero in our plant today, and why we're low on inventory. We're looking at three years of history. Going all the way back to three years is a yellow line, and then two, then last year, yellow ramp. So what happened, if we go all the way back to this yellow line, the urea market was going down, 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 down in the fall. Okay? If the market's going down, 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 what am I going to buy? Well, I'm not going to buy if it's going to be cheaper tomorrow, so I'm going to wait. What happened was, once we flipped over to the gray, when we got into February, we realized we don't have enough inventory. Drove the market up. Drove the market up $300 in three months. And really due to our, all our fault, we didn't plan to move. So we get through this. What happens last year? We start out, we trail through, we get into the summer and the fall months, and the market's flat to down. All we heard all year long was, there's all kinds of urea in the world, this market is soft, don't buy. So we didn't. Got here, river closed. You guys will usually get a little bump when the river closed because transportation is different. We're sitting over here today, we tailed down a little bit, and my chart's a week old now or a little over. If I was going to put my new ink, I'd be up 50 bucks a day. So, the last two weeks, we've seen appreciation in the market of 50 bucks. You know why? We don't have any inventory. Do I have any inventory down in Mississippi anymore? Now, I don't know that we'll see this, but my guess is we'll be somewhere in we're going to see another 50 to 100 bucks in this urea market before spring if things don't change. Now that's one challenge. The other challenge is worldwide, there's still a lot of urea out there. I know already I can buy urea next fall into this level. Which looking back at my chart, we should be doing it. We should be planning ahead. But that's how fickle this market is. Short term, it's got a lot of strength. Long term, we're going to come back off again. And hydrous ammonia, you guys don't do a lot of ammonia. Uh, really, the story there is the same thing. Last fall, we kind of came down, we found a level that leveled off. Actually, demand was lower, less than what they wanted. It came down again. If you're in <coughs> hydrous ammonia, if you used ammonia, ammonia is a good buy today. UAN of 28, really the same story. Um, 
looks like a lot of gyrations there, but really not. A lot has happened in this market for a long time. Up maybe just a little bit. That's pretty typical. Uh, but really a good buy. Look at the last few years. UAM's a good buy. Same story as phosphates. But phosphates are a lot like urea. We went through fall, this thing tailed down, tailed down, tailed down, tailed down, and we didn't buy. Because every day we looked, it was down a little bit. We didn't want to buy unless we knew we were at the bottom. About this time of year, the suppliers would call us and say, geez, buy something, do something. There's piles building, floor, we gotta get, we gotta move it. Well, we held our held our uh, spot so long, actually they exported it something. They said, all right, we found a buyer that moves them out. Actually, we went to China, first time in a long, long time. So we're back over here, starting to move up. Again, my chart will be up here someplace today. In just two weeks, we've seen $50 in phosphates in two weeks. A little bit more of that story. Um, you, you, Federated is a DAP user. DAP markets extremely tight. That's even tighter than MAP. Just so doing two products, getting yeah, MAP. Due to some things or some changes and whatnot, but anyway, this DAP market is getting tight. We went from way too much last fall to really tight this spring. I was told yesterday that the phosphate manufacturers won't take an order or won't ship an order until sometime towards the end of April or first part of May. That's too late. So even if we put an order in, I don't think we get it on time. The other story of phosphates is there's two major producers in the U.S., CF and Mosaic. Together they combine to make somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the total production. That's a lot of production in two players. Mosaic is in the process of buying out CF. Matter of fact, about two weeks ago the government said that's an okay thing, not a problem. That means Mosaic will be in control of almost 70 percent of that's possible. That's a big deal. That's not very comfortable for me. Actually, I look at North Africa and the Moroccan guys as being a little more favorable. Some more news we heard yesterday. And again, you got to understand, this time of year, every news we get is bad news. I never get good news this time. They can't load the ships in Morocco because they've got rough water over there. They can't get the ship in or we've got a problem the bottom line. So what we do have, maybe water over there, is also being delayed. So this adds to the confusion in the pile. Potash, a little story about potash. And it kind of fits in with, you know, the Olympics are going on now. We're hearing all the, the problems over there in Russia. They can get working, they working, and it's kind of unique. We talked about uh, the Russians are in the potash game. We got two companies over there in Russia working together. And last July, they split. Neither one trusted the other. They thought the other guy was getting the better end of the deal. Couldn't get along, they said, We're going to go our own ways, we're going to market ourselves, and both of them are going to show the world how to market fertilizer. Right away that day, the news came out fertilizer is going to come down 100 bucks a ton. And we all said, Yeah, whatever. It, it, it'll have an impact. 100 bucks a ton? I mean, that's 25% of them. The dollars that are in the market. And I said, Ah, it's not going to happen. Here's last year, about July, it was the 70s. They took 100 bucks out of the market. It didn't happen overnight. It took some time. And what they did, they went to the world market, they sold a little bit here and a little bit there. And as they kept selling, they kept going lower and lower. And the other guys, the Canadians, if they wanted to compete, they had to bring their price down. So something half a world away that we really didn't think was that big a deal can impact our markets pretty dramatically. Potash today, as compared to the last three years, is a really good buy. One thing to look at as you look at the charts, if you walk through them in the last three years, from coming this year to being the fourth, nitrogen's are the best buy they've been, phosphates are the best buy they've been, potash is the best buy. Fertilizer's a good value. Now I know I'll be challenged with guys will say if I had a good corn chart that laid this over, corn would be down here too. And you're right. Corn's off about the same percentages as corn went down, fertilizer came with. Well. But the challenge I'll have to you guys is that. We know that these markets won't stay down here very long. They'll move up any chance they get. So as you're doing your planning and your, and, and, and your budget, land rents haven't changed, your machinery payments haven't changed, your seat costs probably haven't changed, or maybe a touch higher, your camp costs haven't changed. You're thinking at four dollar corn, I gotta trim something. So the first thing that gets trimmed is P and K. Slow down and evaluate that and make sure that you don't miss and you buy P and K up here in a year when the market's high. It's 
to get by today. And we all know it takes fertilizer to grow potatoes. So in summary, real quick, the nitrogen market short term looks strong. Long term will, will tail back off again in the summer, in the fall. Phosphates are doing the same thing, a little bit harder to read. A week ago, I would say they're strong through spring and will tail off. They may stay strong a little bit longer. And really, potash is maybe even more flat than up. Um, it's maybe up a couple of bucks, which is really no strength that we can see in the way of potash today. So that was my spiel real quick, a lot of information.